Okay, everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Round. I hope this finds you all well, safe, and healthy. Uh, thank you again to all of you working on the front lines of this pandemic. We do also, again, thank you for your cooperation as we transition Grand Rounds to an online format. Uh, we are pleased to have Dr. Shafazan, Damas, Goodman, and Shulman present today on COVID-19. Our original speaker for today, Dr. Sandra Taylor, will be rescheduled to a later date. Uh, we are grateful to today's speakers for their time to present on these very relevant and important topics. Dr. Sheeran Shafazan is a clinical professor of medicine within the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine and the director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Clinics at U Health Tower. She also has a joint appointment within the Department of Public Health. Dr. Shafazan obtained her undergraduate and medical degrees at the University of Toronto, followed by internal medicine residency at the same institution. She then went on to complete fellowships in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at Stanford University, where she also obtained her master's of science in health and research, health research and policy. Dr. Shafazan will present today on the pulmonary manifestations and management of COVID-19. Dr. Oriana Adamas is an assistant professor of medicine within the division of gastroenterology, where she serves as the director of translational studies for the Sussman Family Crohn's and Colitis Center. Dr. Damas completed her undergraduate medical and postgraduate medical training all at the University of Miami. She has received several national grants in support of her research on Hispanics with inflammatory bowel disease. And Dr. Damas will speak today about the gastrointestinal manifestations of COVID-19. Dr. Kenneth Goodman, PhD, Fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics and Fellow of the American College of Epidemiology, is founder and director of the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine's Institute for Bioethics and Health Policy and co-director of the university's ethics programs. He is a professor of medicine with appointments in the departments of philosophy, health informatics, public health sciences, school of nursing and health studies, and the department of anesthesiology. As well, Dr. Goodman serves in several leadership positions in Florida and national professional societies. Dr. Goodman will present today on ethical considerations when treating COVID-19 patients. Finally, we have Dr. Carl Schulman, MD, PhD, who will present an update on COVID-19 research being conducted at the University of Miami. Dr. Schulman is a professor of surgery, Eunice Bernhard Endowed Chair in Burns, Executive Dean for Research and Director of the William Lehman Injury Research Center at Rida Trauma Center. Dr. Schulman earned his medical degree from the University of South Florida followed by postgraduate medical training in general surgery and surgical critical care here at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. He then completed a two-year NIH, NIH fellowship in research training. He also completed his master's of science in public health and a PhD in epidemiology to enhance his current research interests focusing on the epidemiology of burns and trauma, where he has authored over 150 publications and serves as a reviewer for several national journals. So thank you again to our speakers for their time and efforts. We now turn our attention to Dr. Shafazan for our first presentation. Great, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so I'm gonna try in 10 minutes, go over um, the pulmonary manifestations and managements of COVID. And let me see, there we go. I don't have control yet to be able to move the slide. So maybe someone else can take control then. And uh, next slide, please. You can go into presentation mode and next slide. Let me see if this allows me to present. Hold on. No, I don't have control. Okay. Okay. So um, the only reason I bring up the virology is not so much that we don't know anything about it, which we do, but to highlight the point that um, the virus enters through the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2. And uh, ACE2 is very predominant on the surface of type 2 pneumocytes and alveoli um, and um, could be the, uh, one of the pathophysiological mechanisms of this disease and why the lungs are so much involved in this disease. I put this slide up to put things into perspective. Um, my ID colleagues will know this better than me, but with respect to, from the epidemiological perspective, we do something called an r naught. We calculate something called an r naught, which is a measure of infectivity of the virus. And measles, for example, is highly contagious because one person can infect up to 18 people. And you can imagine the trajectory of that. Uh, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 and influenza are similar, except of course the um, SARS-CoV-2 is more, uh, um, has higher case fatality than influenza type B, but 
roughly in the range of between two to three people get infected for any one person that's infected. And that is why we're seeing the trajectory that we're seeing. And that is why social distancing is very important because what we need for this epidemic, or actually this pandemic to stop is for the R naught to drop less than one. Um, and that will require an effort from everyone. Next slide, please. And I, most of the data that we have right now with respect to the uh, clinical manifestations is coming out of China, but we certainly have our colleagues from Italy and Washington who have some published data and then from all the conference calls that we're on with them. So what, if, what I'm going to be saying, although the data is from February 2020, we are seeing the same kind of patterns uh, in our patients as well. Namely, as you know, the age 30 to 79 is at highest risk and the Chinese div uh, divided into mild, severe, critical. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit when I talk about the lung manifestations, but in general, 81% are going to be mild, but it's the 20% who end up in the hospital, they're divided into severe and critical. And the Chinese uh, case fatality rate was 2.3% overall, but again, note that those who are greater than 80 years have the highest case fatality. And um, those who end up, the 5% who are critical enough to end up in our ICUs, unfortunately have up to 50% case fatality or, or death rate. The other key thing that I wanna highlight is the, of course, infectivity and the, um, the number of people, healthcare personnel that infected. The report overall for China was close to 4%, much higher in the epicenter. Uh, but what we're seeing in Italy and Washington State um, and, and trickling down now even to Florida, we are seeing that the, there is a high number of healthcare personnel who are becoming infected and of those 15% of them end up being severe or critical and uh, that is a very sobering number for all of us. Um, so the case fatality rates are ranging and U.S. right now as of March 29 is 1.75 percent but you can see depending on how it's defined it's going to be different and I put down these numbers because they're pretty old right now just to show that the trend in the U.S. with respect to ICU admissions hospitalizations and fatalities is very similar to what I've been quoting for China. Transmission is very important because the transmission is by droplet for the most part. Of course, there's contact as well, um, but that's where the lungs come into play. Uh, we inhale these droplets and the first place they go are into the lungs and most of the burden of the disease is because of the lungs. Um, aerosolization is a big deal. Bronchoscopy, endoscopy, anything that nebulizes an COVID infected person could increase the risk for the healthcare provider. And there's some data right now that suggests that even micro droplets, so these are not the big droplets that come from coughing and sneezing, but just from regular loud talking could have an impact in transmission of the disease, but this is early data yet. Incubation period is also important when you start thinking about taking care of your patients. So on average, from the time of infection, it takes about four to five days for symptoms to start manifesting, but it can take up to 14 days. So keep that range in mind, sometimes even longer. So getting to how this um, disease, if you will, has been classified very crudely into mild, severe, or critical. And um, mild disease are the people who are either asymptomatic shredders, um, shedders, or they are um, have some what most people would describe as upper respiratory tract because they have a little bit of fever, they have some cough, they have malaise. At this stage, some people, if you were to do a chest x-ray, you would might see the radiographic abnormalities, uh, which are the ground glass opacities that I'll show you in a second. But that's in 81% of the cases, fortunately. Unfortunately, the remainder of the patients end up hospitalized. And these hospitalized patients have a range of presentations, including dyspnea. The high fevers are typically occur in the hospitalized people, so you do not necessarily need to see fever when you have the mild form of the disease or early on in the disease process. And then depending on how bad their oxygenation is, it rapidly could progress to the critical disease Disease, which is where you have acute respiratory distress syndrome or respiratory failure and can move on to shock. I put this up, um, you know, this is just one example of an evaluation guide from UCSF. We have similar concepts uh, going around, but the bottom, and the reason I put this up is to highlight just a few key laboratory abnormalities. As I mentioned, fever occurs in almost all hospitalized patients, up to 70, greater than 75%, but at the beginning, you may not have fever. So do not hang on fever as being a diagnostic criteria for this person's high risk for COVID. The CBC is very important because leukopenia and especially lymphopenia exists in the majority of people who are COVID positive and up to 85%. And as the lymphopenia progresses, their uh, risk factors for progressing into worse diseases also increase. Um, of course, the other high point that I want to highlight in the management of these patients is that, yes, we're all very focused on COVID, but we're still in flu season. We're also could have other infections, bacterial. And uh, so 
the workup should include to ruling in or ruling out other diseases as well. And then there's some chest X-ray characteristics that I will spend a little bit of time on. I brought, I put this up as a timeline and uh, I'll highlight it actually here for you um, on the next slide. You can see that the first week, uh, even for hospitalized patients, that first week tends to be, or for first week from infection tends to be a relatively okay week for most people. By day five, they start manifesting symptoms. Probably by day six or seven, they end up in the hospital. That's when they start feeling more short of breath and requiring oxygen, but we can get by with four or five, six liters of oxygen. But into the second week, there's a rapid progression. And those who are going to end up in the ICU, you begin to see it around day eight to nine, where they require um, ICU care and higher levels of oxygen and maybe even intubation. So this also correlates with imaging, which I do not advocate that we do, but the fact is from the data that we already have, we can see that there's progression of imaging for people who are getting worse. So chest x-ray, most of us now with COVID think that, okay, we're looking for bilateral ground glass opacities. But, uh, and that is certainly typical. Um, it's not diagnostic, but it's certainly typical in patients with COVID. But you can, and I want to caution you, you can have someone who has um, SARS-CoV-2 positive and presents with unilateral abnormalities on their chest x-ray. Or if they're early on in the disease process, they may have such subtle findings that on chest x-ray, you may not even be able to pick it up. So do not rule out just because the person has unilateral findings on their chest x-ray. This is more typical of what you would see in people who are progressing and needing more oxygen of course, this person was intubated. But um, in this, you see the bilateral patchy kind of opacities that is not uh, specific for COVID, but specific for um, acute, but, but more diagnostic for acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and so, of course, this is a very severe patient. We do not have that much CT experience for a variety of reasons, because uh, just the concept of having someone who is COVID, high suspicion for COVID or COVID positive, going into the CT scanner and the risk to the people taking care of that person, but also in terms of how to decontaminate the area in a timely fashion, CTs are probably not where we're headed unless there's an absolute indication for a CT scan. But this experience comes out of China where they typically were doing a lot of CT scans in the beginning. And this is the typical ground glass opacity that can be observed in someone. So this hazy grayness that can be observed in someone with- uh, Two minutes, Dr. Kapazan. Two Sorry? minutes. Two, two minutes. Oh. Okay. I only have two minutes. Okay, so then I have to be quick. So this is just a progression um, in the uh, CT scan in someone who uh, died from COVID, and in this person, they actually end up recovering. So you can see after day 18, their CT scan recovered. Nowadays, we also have ultrasound available to us, and we can actually make the diagnosis. There's some typical findings on ultrasound for making the diagnosis. So because I have so little time, let me just spend the rest of it on this concept of acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome is a very heterogeneous condition. In essence, it's the exuberant lung response to an inflammation that's happening in the body. So you can have any number of viral bacterial infections, but also post-surgery, you can see this condition. And it is um, defined by uh, characteristic clinical findings, chest x-ray findings, CT findings, and um, um, oxygenation. Overall, ARDS has an up to 43% mortality. So even irrespective of COVID, we see that this mortality. These are the criteria that we have for ARDS. I'm not going to belabor at the point, but in a setting where we don't want to do chest x-rays and CT scans, ultrasounds can be used certainly. And in a setting that we don't want to do ABGs, we can use the ratio of the oxygen saturation to the FiO2 to say that this person's oxygenation is worsening. The reason it's important to define these people as ARDS is that we have good years of experience now with good data suggests that there is a certain ventilation strategy and certain management strategy that we use for people with ARDS. The key that ventilation strategy though is that we have to go what's called low tidal volume ventilation where we allow the PCO2 to climb, but we try and save the lungs because high volumes can cause lung injury by themselves. Um, this is sort of a stepwise approach. And for those of you who tomorrow might be joining in, we will go more detail into the stepwise approach this is um, that we have for um, ARDS. But just for COVID-19, in the beginning when the patient presents, we try and maintain the oxygen saturation between 19 to 96. Slide, Dr. Please don't speak so fast, but just give us the... Okay, give you the lowdown. Okay, so 
we start off with oxygen, low flow oxygen. Once you're at six liters of oxygen, um, you have to start considering other modalities. This is a time where intubation may be considered in some people because they can rapidly progress, or we use high flow nasal cannula for a time with a lot of monitoring and then decide on intubation. Proning is something that we're using and has had good effect in terms of improving oxygenation in patients with COVID. I want to note that proning is not only in the domain of someone who's intubated, you can ask someone who is awake to actually lie on their stomach and that helps with their oxygenation as well. This is the floor chart that we've developed and we're going to be going over into detail tomorrow. Um, and there's some pulmonary pearls that I want to leave you with, with respect to COVID-19. One is this concept of silent hypoxemia, which means that um, the patient may actually not appear to be in respiratory distress, but they're profoundly hypoxemic. So don't just go by their tachypnea or their respiratory rate. It's actually very um, unsettling when you see these patients. The other one is that the ARDS pathophysiology typically leads to the lung compliance being decrease and therefore we have certain vent the ventilation strategies that I talked about. But we are finding that in some people with COVID, in fact, their lung compliance is normal, which means that in some scenarios, you can actually be more generous with the amount of tidal volume that you give and you don't have to give as much end expiratory pressure. And finally, the one thing that I wanted to comment on is this cytokine storm syndrome, which is really the domain of our, my rheumatology friends and immunology friends who know this well. You see it in some rheumatological conditions, but you also see it in septic shock and certainly other viral infections, where, as I mentioned, there is an exuberant Thank you, doctor. Outpouring. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. You're we welcome. need to move on. We appreciate yeah. it. There's loads of really important information, but we want to just get the highlights out to the um, to our. Oh my goodness! We'll have all these slides available for sure uh, in, 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 online. Okay, Dr. Damas. Okay, I'm up next. Hi, everybody. So I'm here to talk to you about the GI manifestations of COVID, which are just recently gaining a lot of recognition, especially in the media. Um, so the objectives of my talk are to talk about the SARS-CoV-2 point of entry in the GI tract, which may explain why patients develop manifestations of GI in the first place. And we'll go over what are the GI manifestations and what are some of the hepatology findings that you'll find in the labs as well. And then finally, we'll go over briefly what are some of the potentials for fecal oral transmission and what are the implications of fecal oral transmission in the first place. And I'll point my attention now to this beautiful picture that you see on the right, which is actually a picture of the virus entering and touching the cilia in the lungs. And it's one of the first pictures that we see of COVID-19 in the lungs. Okay. What happened here? Okay, so why do we think there's GI manifestations and what's the point of entry? As we all know that SARS-CoV-2 enters through ACE2 receptors. Uh, this study looked at ACE2 receptor expression using transcriptome data from four public databases, and they looked at various organs. And what they found is, as you can see here, is that ACE2 receptor expression is not that high in the lungs, surprisingly, but very high in the ileum, especially, and also seen in the colon. So this can have very important uh, explanation as to why perhaps the virus enters into the ileum and the colon and can explain all the GI manifestations that we're seeing in the first place. So the, uh, digestive symptoms are common. So this was a retrospective study that was done out of China and looked at a total of 204 patients of which approximately 50% developed GI symptoms. And you can see in this pie graph right here, which was neatly representing all the different manifestations, that about half of them, which is in purple, 47% developed GI manifestations in combination with respiratory symptoms, whereas a little bit lower than half developed exclusive respiratory symptoms. And what we also find is that about 3% of patients developed exclusive GI symptoms without really having any respiratory symptoms at all. And this 9% of patients represent patients that were completely asymptomatic. And importantly, 47% of those that develop respiratory symptoms and also GI symptoms also appear to have a more severe manifestation of their disease. And we'll go over that in a little bit later. Whereas a recent study that I couldn't uh, show in this graph because it was published yesterday, shows that those that are uh, asymptomatic from respiratory symptoms and particularly present with GI symptoms exclusively, uh, tend to have a milder onset of disease. So what are the GI manifestations in the first place? Because we all tend to think a lot about diarrhea. But actually, the most common symptom seems to be anorexia, followed then by abdominal pain and vomiting, and also by diarrhea thereafter in about a third of the patients. Less commonly um, is abdominal pain. 
And we see this data more in the literature and different studies published coming out of China in reputable journals. We find that, for example, nausea is very common, vomiting is very common, abdominal pain less so common, and diarrhea again seen in about a third of the patients, with many and most patients actually presenting with a loss of appetite. And if I can turn your attention now to the table one here, you can see that when they risk stratified in a different study looking at 651 patients, by those that developed GI symptoms and those that didn't, those that if you scroll all the way down here, you can see that a greater proportion of patients that developed GI symptoms had more severe presentation, meaning more respiratory symptoms, more ICU, more ARDS, compared to those that did not develop respiratory symptoms in the first place. And so what are the implications of GI symptoms, right? We've already discussed that GI symptoms are common. There is ACE2 receptor expression in, uh, in the ileum and in the colon, but does that mean that there's potential for fecal oral transmission? So we know that SARS-CoV-2 can be found in the stool. We've seen that in some studies. We see 83% of patients in stool specimens in a pediatric case series tested positive, and that stool actually, the virus remained present up to 30 days after onset. We see similar presentation of stool pre uh, virus present in the stool in a study coming out of Singapore and also um, along other studies that were coming out of China. And so we know that there's ACE2 receptor expression in the intestines, but what we also find in this study is that they were detected in the gastric duodenal erector glandular epithelial cells, meaning that the virus, as you can see here, actually enhanced in these different um, epithelial cells in the lining of the stomach, of the duodenum, and in the colon. And so what the, this other study looked at 74 patients to, in total with COVID-19, and they found that 55% of patients developed virus uh, or had the presence of virus in the stool. And if I can turn your attention here in this graph, what you see is that in orange, these are the virus being present in the respiratory samples, but you can see that in the stool, and this is all January, February, and different dates, in the stool, it stays present a lot longer. So respiratory samples were positive for a mean of 16.7 days, Whereas in the stool, it was approximately 27.9 days with a mean of 11.2 days longer in the stool than in the respiratory samples. We see an outlier that had the presence of, those, of the virus in the stool for 47 days. And so as um, was mentioned earlier, this can have important uh, implications, for example, for surface transmission of the virus as patients don't wash their hands and leave it on different surfaces. And we know that, for example, in steel and plastic, the virus can stay a lot longer. So what do we know and what can we gather about fecal oral transmission from earlier coronaviruses? Well, we know that there, in the SARS outbreak and in the MERS outbreak, GI symptoms are very common. In vitro studies of MERS also showed that the virus could actually replicate, replicate in human primary intestinal epithelial cells. And we know that in vivo studies, and this was in a case of one actually, uh, using MERS virus, they found that the virus infected the small intestine and then progressed to form on a pulmonary infection, thereby suggesting that there is a potential entry of the virus into the intestines, which can form, replicate, and then thereby cause full-on disease. We also see COVID-19 COVID manifestations in the liver. These are all the articles that have been published here on your right, which demonstrate that there is an abnormality, particularly in ALT and in AST, more so in ALT, ranging from 16 to 53% of COVID-19 patients. Uh, much less commonly seen outclass and total bilirubin abnormalities, although as you can see, GGT was also elevated in about half of patients. We don't exactly know why the liver enzymes are elevated. We think that it's potentially from either drugs being used to treat the disease as well as sepsis, but there is ACE2 receptor expression in the liver, which can also explain why, and there may be direct viral hepatitis taking place. So what are the implications of potential fecal oral transmission? Well, we know that there's presence in the stool and that it can stay longer, but is a virus actually infectious? So I'll tell you, I didn't have time to include this now because, because it came out today, but there was a recent Nature publication that looked at infectivity in different uh, shedding of the virus, and it found that in nine total patients that they looked at, the virus was not infectious in the stool. So even though it's nine patients, I still think we need to think about this and the repercussions that potential fecal oral transmission can have, especially because as I mentioned to you, there is some potential fecal oral transmission taking place in prior coronaviruses. So should we also screen for patients that have exclusive GI symptoms? We know that they may have milder disease. And should we check for eradication of the virus in the stool? These are still answers that we don't know. 
Um, and what is a potential effect of fecal oral transmission as far as a public health threat? Could it explain, for example, why there's been several cruise ship transmissions uh, in patients, um, as you all know? And so what are the implications for endoscopy? Uh, endoscopy, as was mentioned earlier, is a high-risk procedure, which is why we've moved to uh, scoping only urgent uh, and emergent uh, patients that need endoscopies or colonoscopies. Why? Because there's respiratory droplets, there's also aerosols generated during the endoscopy, but then there's also the potential for contamination, which now includes stool. So this is a GI recommendations published in uh, one of our GI journals, which risk stratifies patients as high risk, intermediate, and low risk. And those that are high risk, meaning they're COVID positive, or they're waiting to be tested, and they're probably positive, they recommend full-on protective gear, as well as in those that are intermediate risk and having an upper endoscopy. So some take home points, GI symptoms are common. I hope I've made that clear now. Uh, mainly symptoms of anorexia, nausea, vomiting, but also diarrhea can be present if to, in up to a third of patients. Uh, GI symptoms can be a marker of disease severity, particularly when they present in combination with respiratory symptoms. When they're by themselves, they don't tend to be, uh, it doesn't tend to be as severe, of course. Transaminitis is common and can also be a presentation of more severe disease. And the virus, we still have to find out because we know it's shed in the stool, but we need, still need to understand whether it's infectious or not. Because if it is, it has very important uh, public health implications. Thank you. Dr. Goodman. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Do I have uh, control of the slides? Uh, perhaps not. So, so, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, a lot of what I want to share uh, is the result of a document that's ongoing with Dr. Weiss's encouragement and support, uh, but where the heavy lifting in terms of some of the most difficult issues are being done by some of our colleagues. So it's worth a shout out, if you'll forgive me, to Drs. Gershengorn, Holt, Kett, and Brasco from Pediatrics. Um, our context here is we in the United States do not enjoy a particularly efficient healthcare system. It's an affluent country that actually uh, is, is now contemplating and very often in other contexts uh, endures scarce resources. Against that background, highly committed professionals who as we've seen at our institutions are putting their shoulders to the wheel and, and, and willingly incurring risk for the sake of, for the sake of, the, uh, for the sake of our patients, our community. Uh, next. You just have to respond uh, the slideshow, Dr. Goodman. You're in control. Uh, now I have someone else's slideshow, though. Give me just a second. There you go. You're in control. Well, wait, let's see if down arrow does it. Um, let me just ask. I, I seem not, well, this is very slow. Um, uh, in Britain, you may have seen this. Um, I think that most Americans are happy to send a shout out to their clinicians and their institutions, although not perhaps to the, to, uh, to, to the overarching healthcare system. Uh, that matters because we're going to be talking about the trust of our patients when it comes to altered standards of care. And that produces challenges that are shaped by the following. Uh, in New York, for example, there's an executive order that's limited liability. If there's time, perhaps later we can discuss that. What we are trying to do in the current circumstances is make the case for altered standards of care with protections for the institutions and the clinicians who need to make judgments of the sort that are really quite rare for them. Hmm. And so, um, uh, among the issues we face, the, perhaps the most the most uh, difficult one has to do with resource allocation, um, uh, beginning with ventilators, uh, with the following challenges, which are, are being hotly debated. Uh, one, how we're going to ration them when we need to ration them, whether or not they can be splitted, split, or they can be split or not, and we use one ventilator to uh, to support more than one patient, either two or four. Uh, and then the question of reallocation, maybe the trickiest and most difficult issue of all, namely, if I'm on a ventilator and you see that I am going to die no matter what, and you have another patient who but for a ventilator would survive, is it going to be permissible in an emergency to take it away from me and give it to that other patient? 
there could be no more difficult a decision. The challenge that I think we face, uh, that you're going to face is, is whether or not you want to do the math and say, if you keep me on the ventilator, then I die anyway, as long as the other, along with the other patient who doesn't get one. Uh, people are going to be a scarce resource. Um, we, we, uh, we are so far so good, but in fact, you are seeing clinicians at our institution and elsewhere who are in fact becoming infected. Uh, that's a, that's a, it impinges on the workforce and our ability to, 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 uh, uh, to uh, fulfill our mission. Uh, that may mean that we're going to require altered standards of care for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. For example, if you believe that CPR will not be beneficial to a patient, uh, then we're trying to produce support for you to say we're not going to do it in this case. The time that it takes, the exposure that it increases, uh, and the effects that those have on other patients who would benefit uh, need to be put into the calculation. Same for ECMO, which is resource intensive and is very hard to imagine being effectively used in an emergency if the situation gets really bad. Uh, we're also going to be facing challenges related to drugs, blood, and other resources. Other issues. Um, uh, in Tallahassee, a disabilities group has just uh, sent a letter to the governor saying, please make sure that none of your rationing or triage discriminates against people with disabilities. Uh, we are trying to manage that now. Dr. Barrasco's good work with the state and others are trying to make clear that the kind of objective evidence-based um, support we're trying to provide actually is prophylaxis against bias, uh, either against people with disabilities, minorities, and so forth. Uh, an issue that would be a beautiful grand rounds on its own is whether or not our healthcare professionals themselves should be privileged or given priority in the calculations that are being undertaken. That would include uh, uh, physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, maintenance workers who clean the rooms. Some institutions have, have said that, that their, their professionals should be, should be given priority. Others disagree with that. Uh, what's the role of medical students? We've decided not to expose our students in the current environment, but uh, the team that we put together uh, uh, with our intensivists has actually working with a group of medical students, uh, a large group to actually try and do daily calculations of SOFA scores and prepare spreadsheets so a triage committee will be able to have access to them. Our, our students are, are uh, really rather delighted to have something really important to do and contribute to this process. Um, we are getting some stories, uh, reports rather, of, of physicians and nurses and others who are saying, if you can't guarantee me PPE equipment, I actually do not want to participate in, in care of our patients. Uh, I mention it only because it's an issue that has been raised on uh, us uh, And then there's a question of the duties of our institutions to make sure that clinicians' families are provided for and to what extent those duties can be actually realized or appropriately metabolized. Uh, a couple of quotations here to provide the overarching ethical foundations. It turns out that a number of us contributed to the Department of Health's effort in Florida a decade ago in the context of H1N1 to make clear that the, the, the foundations here uh, uh, for altered standards are based on the idea that the demand for resources will outstrip supply and out of necessity, scarce resources will have to be allocated so as to so do the greatest good for the greatest number. That view is, is paralleled in the, by the Institute of Medicine, uh, which makes a very similar point, namely that the changes in the level of care are justified by circumstances and formally declared, and they, they said by state government, uh, in recognition that there's a crisis. There's a group of people around the state who are working with the Florida Hospital Association to try and get the governor to provide um, uh, to, to provide legal support for institutions and, and clinicians uh, who are doing their best to save as many lives as possible. In other words, you would not want to penalize someone legally for saving lives. Uh, there are some lawyers who believe in the current situation there's a risk of that. Um, the, the other organization that's worth mentioning is the just a lag at the Center for Disease Control. Uh, we participated in a CDC work group a decade ago that basically said exactly the same thing. The priority needs to be given to those who are most likely to recover. These are difficult and probabilistic decisions. They are going to be fallible, but not having some sort of plan in place, everyone agrees, would be irresponsible. Um, forgive the acronym, uh, but one of the challenges we face is uh, related to public understanding of science. Uh, you have seen uh, in, in the news 
uh, that utterances by people who perhaps should not be made giving health advice to large audiences uh, have noted that chloroquine and, and, and hydroxychloroquine might actually be useful in some cases. Uh, there's an inadequate evidence base to support that. That has led some people, as you may have read, to discover that their fish tank has a chemical called chloroquine phosphate. A number of people have actually ingested that. Uh, that, as you can imagine, is a really bad idea. The CDC has actually issued a warning about it. Um, it has also led to shortages of, of hydroxychloroquine for lupus patients. Um, there are a number of drugs where we're going to be trying to decide whether or not the evidence base is, is large enough to, all, to, to, to try them in different circumstances. That's true for Toxie as well. Uh, every, every drug, and for that matter, every ventilator might be regarded now as a, as a trial of therapy. Uh, but whether or not to use a scarce drug in that is going to require one, difficult clinical judgments, and two, the supports, perhaps if, you, if, if, if I get a chance to talk about it, the triage teams that we're trying to assemble. Uh, we uh, operate in an environment that's shaped by more or less and more or less good evidence. Against the background of public misunderstanding of science, um, uh, I, I've come to the conclusion that misunderstanding of science is actually among the social determinants of diminished health, if not disease. Uh, trying to explain to lay people probabilistic decision making is a great challenge. Or as a colleague once put it to me, how do you explain these concepts to people who buy lottery tickets? Uh, that's another story. Uh, it involves thresholds for off-label use, decisions under uncertainty, decisions under scarcity, and then, and then the, uh, the conjunction of those two, namely scarce environment shaped by scarcity and uncertainty. Uh, in many cases, what we can do most effective is a kind of collective watchful waiting for more and better evidence, including from our own institutions. Uh, I think that we have an obligation, if not an opportunity, or maybe it's vice versa, to gather as much data as possible from, the, uh, from, from our uh, uh, current interventions and try and see in our population what seems to be uh, most efficacious, being mindful, of course, what is being uh, provided in the peer review literature. It's an argument for professional prudence, however, over what is sometimes magical thinking by patients. Um, several conclusions. On rare occasions, the, the clinician-patient relationship is not preeminent. Namely, it is the clinician-community relationship. Uh, this is part of our curriculum for medical students and others. Namely, while, while your patient comes first, in some cases that might not be possible. Uh, public health emergency can be one of those times. Data and evidence are good prophylaxis against bias. Uh, that I would argue that ethics is clear even if the law is not. Uh, and the clinicians need institutional governmental support. Um, we are trying, as I say, to move that forward in a number of different circumstances uh, to make sure that you all who are providing direct support for patients have as much legal covering fire as possible. That includes triage committees uh, or a process to buffer you from some exquisitely difficult decisions. Uh, Dr. Weiss and others are leading, are leading teams that will be attempting to do precisely that. Uh, and that evidence, even probabilistic evidence, fallible evidence, is better than the alternatives. There's no requirement that you be uh, infallible. The requirement is collectively we do the best we can with the cards that we have been dealt. Thank you. Well, it looks like I'm the uh, cleanup hitter here. So in the next 10 minutes, uh, I'm gonna give an update on COVID-19 related research that is happening at the medical school. See if I have control of the slides. Yes. So the first thing uh, that happened is we decided that we would scale back a couple of weeks to just critical research activities. Basically, we published guidance for what was considered a critical research activity and then distributed a Qualtrics survey to all researchers to determine what was going on. This was then cleaned and sorted and we got more information from those that we needed it and underwent an extensive review by myself in the office of the Vice Provost of Research. And as of last Friday, um, we have over 110 clinical research projects that continue, over 120 basic science research projects and activities maintaining things that'll continue. And many of our faculty have realized they don't have uh, critical research going on and have transitioned to other activities. It should be noted for all listening, if you submitted one of those things and you did not hear back from us, that means your critical research can continue at this time at least. So the things that we determined were critical in terms of basic science research were things like maintaining and freezing unique cell lines, maintaining instruments, maintaining animal populations, 
and really maintaining research for which shutting down or stopping would result in a critical loss of animals, materials, and data. So there's lots of people who are winding down ongoing things and not starting new things. On the clinical research side, this is a chart that was uh, published by many and used by many, and we're following it as well. And for clinical research, it's really based on the benefit to the subject in the trial. For randomized controlled trials with efficacious possibilities for the patients, those are continuing both in new enrollments and follow-ups. And many of these are cancer trials, phase three trials. For lesser phase trials and for non-interventional trials, follow-ups for clinical patients are continuing. When possible, they're being switched to virtual and non-face-to-face -face meetings, and most non-interventional trials uh, have stopped, or pretty much all of them have stopped. So uh, we have lots of things going on in terms of research. So the next three things talk about rapid testing that's going on here. And so this slide shows what's happening by Sylvia Donnert and Sapnadeo in biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, they've developed a DNA-based rapid testing technique that uses a pharyngeal swab mixed into transport media and is amplified and incubated. And literally a nanotechnology produced test strip is inserted into this fluid and you get your results in total time of 20 to 30 minutes, so similar to a pregnancy test. And this is already working well and we're working on scaling this up and getting the appropriate approvals. Similarly, uh, Mario Stevenson in infectious disease has been modifying his viral detection platform um, to more rapidly detect coronavirus. So this uses a novel polymerase that doesn't require isolation of the viral RNA or a separate step for DNA generation. And the result is the assay time is less than an hour and it uses the standard PCR techniques. Both uh, Sylvia and Mario um, are repurposing what they did for the Zika virus uh, to the coronavirus as an idea or an example of how our work on emerging pathogens could continue to have tremendous benefit on future outbreaks. Likewise, um, Liz Franzman, <coughs> who works at ENT, um, has a very successful and uh, longstanding program using um, oral samples to detect cancer in head and neck cancers. And she has been working to reprogram this to change her cancer test to a coronavirus test. Um, and this is another great way um, to look at early detection. It'll also use an already commercially available test as the backbone. We all know that salivary antibodies are sometimes our first line of protection, and it could be another simple, less invasive alternative to the testing. Um, the one thing I'm not mentioning is serology testing, which is coming down the line shortly, but um, the availability of that um, is still lacking. Those are being done by commercial labs. In terms of vaccine development in microbiology and immunology, we have Natasha Sturbo, who's working on a vaccine platform uh, that's a little bit different. This uses the GP96 vaccine backbone, um, and it's designed to reprogram live cells to continually secrete antigens to activate a long-term immune system response that can protect against coronavirus and future mutations. This is work that was started by Eckert Podak um, many years ago and was the formation of the Heat Biologics Company. Um, and uh, just tuning this um, to the COVID virus is now being done. The good news, this has been used in cancer patients successfully, and so its safety is well established. This has also been added to the World Health Organization list of vaccine candidates in development. Other research in general we have going on, Dr. J from Infectious Disease and Dr. Pawa from the uh, CIFAR are working on an epidemiology of coronavirus study. They already have IRB approval to get samples from patients, sorry, subjects and patients that are tested for coronavirus and will be working to look at their epidemiology and looking how the virus affects our local unique uh, ethnographic population in South Florida, looking for risk factors to help guide uh, prevention and treatment efforts. Dr. Kolber from IV is looking into the use of hyperimmune GABA globulin and Dr. Camilla Ricordi has a uh, multi-institutional consortium <clears throat> looking at the use of umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells in patients who develop the severe respiratory complications. Similarly, a local consortium of uh, Josh Hare, Camilla Ricordi, Aisha Khan, and Dr. J are all collaborating on a variety of open access and phase one potential trials. The idea is that there's growing recognition of this cytokine release syndrome or cytokine storm that occurs in the respiratory phase of severe illness. <clears throat> Some are looking at IL-6 monoclonal antibodies, um, and we know that mesenchymal stem cells have a beneficial effect in decreasing the IL-6 storm. And so the question is, is there a role for this 
as an adjunct or precursor to these other potential therapies. Of course, like all the supplies for testing and treatment and drugs, these cells can be in short supply and uh, Josh and, and Camillo and the group is already working with the FDA and other people to work these kinds of things out. But the idea is to create these type of campus-wide, city-wide and national, national consortiums to really move this forward quickly. There's also um, emerging disease pilot funding. The CTSI has uh, funded uh, Sylvia Donnert and Steve, Mario Stevenson and Dr. J to help their efforts. This was really to jumpstart these efforts and make sure we don't lose any time. There's also people, myself included, working on 3D printer innovations. Dr. Jean-Pierre Bardet, the Vice Provost for Strategic Projects, has several multidisciplinary teams he's working with, including myself, microbiology, biomedical engineering, ENT, surgery, and even folks from Johnson & Johnson and we're working on printing 3D masks and printing uh, respirators and disposables for ventilators. Here you see an example of some of our first runs of the uh, hard plastic reusable uh, 3D masks that we're working on. Very challenging project. And lastly, I'm gonna talk just a couple of minutes about the U-Trace team. This is an effort by Dr. Aaron Kobitz and Alberto Coman Martinez, um, who started a project at the Firefighter, Firefighter Cancer, Init Cancer Initiative tracing the exposures of firefighters in their, for cancer materials, and they have repurposed this team to start tracking COVID-19, and you can see what it stands for there. Basically, they um, define the problem. Their purpose is really to track and coordinate the uh, presumptive and confirmed cases throughout UHealth and the Miller School of Medicine. They've extended to first responders and eventually to other parts of Miami-Dade County, as I'll mention briefly. This is a great example of a huge multidisciplinary team of faculty, researchers, staff, students, administrators that have really come together in an unbelievably short amount of time to really take over our contact tracing for this pandemic here in South Florida. They rapidly did a needs assessment. They designed a red cap system to harbor all this data. They implemented this in literally within less than a week and now they are in a maintenance phase and keeping enough trained workforce to keep this going for us. Basically, when someone calls one of the employee hotlines or the student hotlines, the initial medical documentation is done by that office, and then the U-Trace team takes over. They do confirmation and follow-up of all persons under investigation, their symptom documentation, providing education and follow-up using algorithms to determine how that patient needs to uh, self-confine and what the potential return to work and return to employment pathways might be as they recover. Lastly, I'll mention that Erin uh, and her team are also partnering with Miami-Dade County and the mayor's office, trying to work on more widespread testing. The Miami-Dade County might get receipt of a large number of the serology tests that would enable this. And this is really to look at the prevalence of infection in patients who are asymptomatic to see how this is really spreading through the population. Because only until we get that sort of widespread testing are we really gonna have a good scientific rationale for the public health measures that we are implementing. Very last slide is just to acknowledge uh, everybody I didn't mention. There are numerous other clinical trials in various stages of approval. Things you've heard of on the news like hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, the antiretrovirals, monoclonal antibodies, other medications you see here. And some of these are in the IRB stage. Some of these have already been used as part of expanded access protocols and compassionate use protocols via the FDA. Um, and they continue multiple negotiations with companies uh, continue to go on to try and provide these treatments to our patients as soon as possible. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all our speakers today. That was just an excellent uh, tour de force of all the work that's going on uh, here at the University of Miami and the expertise that we have. It's uh, really uh, wonderful to see and I'm grateful for everyone whose time uh, was taken uh, to prepare their presentations for today. There's a number of interesting questions on the chat. As I noted that the chat itself will remain up so people can continue to ask questions even after we adjourn. Uh, we do have a few minutes though to entertain some questions now. The answers to the questions on the chat will be uh, posted on the website the department website and you'll find the answers from the experts to those questions. Just to uh, answer some of the questions that have come through already, um, in Dr. Shafazan's lecture she mentioned an update tomorrow that will be available and all uh, 
faculty and providers should have received an email from me and Dr. Uh, Gershengorn and Dr. Ferreira announcing at noon tomorrow there will be a Zoom conference to uh, educate everybody on the use of a ventilator uh, so that you would, if in the instance calls that we need you to help and take care of patients on ventilators, it will sort of calm you down. There, of course, will be intensivists present in the house uh, at all times, but those of you that want to learn more and how to operate a ventilator, uh, there will be a actual demonstration and lecture on the basics of that. Um, I, I, if you don't have that email, just text me, or rather email me, and I'll be happy to provide it to you. One, also, if you'll note in the chat, there's uh, wonderful resource information um, from Dr. Stevenson, Dr. Goodman, that I think uh, uh, would be very important for you to, uh, to look at. In addition, one of the big issues that we have, of course, is testing. Uh, and what kind of tests are the best tests to use, what tests are available, uh, whether it's detecting the virus itself or looking at antibodies. All these things are actively being uh, looked at, and we hope that next week we'll be able to have a summary for you um, as, and let you know what we know about testing and what's available here at UN. In the meantime, Dr. Shafizan, uh, Dr. Marcus asks, could you please discuss us briefly outcomes for subsets of people who required intubation and mechanical ventilation. In other words, what's the likelihood of recovery once they reach that critical state? So the information that we have is a little bit from Washington, uh, some anecdotal experience from Italy, our own experience, and then the Chinese who actually published their experience. And bottom line, because of development of ARDS and the multi-organ failure, mortality can be as high as 50% or more once you're intubated and you're in the ICU and in that critical condition. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Damus, uh, is there, there's a, a question asked by Dr. Klaus about the um, symptom of lack of taste that's part of the GI tract. And I was wondering if you had any insight <laughs> as to why um, people have uh, uh, this uh, experiencing lack of taste with this virus. Yeah, I saw that question. It's actually a good question because it's getting a lot of media attention lately. Um, there's been some retrospective studies coming out of Italy that show that there is um, a nausea in patients with presenting symptoms as one of the main ones. Um, as far as why, I know that there is that one study which was referenced in the chat that looked at ACE2 receptor expression um, in the airway and in the nose as well. So maybe that's a point of entry, but we really don't know the cause of the symptom at this time. But we know it's common. Thank you. Dr. Goodman, um, many of us physicians have been asked by patients to administer uh, prophylactically uh, hydroxychloroquine and, and azithromycin um, outside of a clinical trial. Um, and uh, what would you, what is the ethics of a physician prescribing such a drug given the information that we have and given the, the issue of uh, availability of these drugs? Uh, that's a wonderful and interesting question. I, I see we're out of time. Um, <laughs> Actually, Dr. Weiss, what, what, I, what, what our clinicians, I think, are really good at is making decisions both about the best interests of patients and also, and also the, the, uh, the penumbra of, of the data around them. In this case, we've already seen that, that, the, that some drugs are now in scarce supply for patients who we know will benefit from them. I mean, lupus patients, right? Uh, that patients are accustomed to asking for all sorts of things that will not necessarily benefit them. And the distinction we make in ethics is between requests and refusals. Refusals of treatment are, are fundamental if I'm capacitated and you're my doctor, but I can make all sorts of requests to you that do not impose a duty on you. I think we need to go into a mode now that is really quite cautious about the use of scarce resources, including unsupported prophylactic use of, of drugs for which we might have far better uses. Thank you. Back to Dr. Shafizan. There are a number of therapies out there that um, have been uh, used in other situations of cytokine storm and the use of uh, various IL-6 antibodies. 
um, although tulsisimab is the most um, uh, spoken about, there are there, there it's very limited, very expensive. Can you let us know about other inhibitors, uh, or rather uh, antibodies that uh, are useful, or is it too early to tell? And then also on, in that same vein, whether or not you want to comment on the use of nitrous oxide and PDE5 inhibitors. Right. So um, it's too early to tell, uh, frankly. Um, I know that the Italians actually are using interleukin-1 blockers, um, which also is involved in that cytokine storm syndrome, but we really don't have any good data. Um, the only data we have is perhaps a handful of people out of China who are interleukin-6 blockers that had a better outcome, but this is not a clinical trial, so we really don't know the answer to that. Um, so in terms of the use of uh, inhaled nitric oxide and inhaled diproposanol, we have used them in ARDS. The data that supports this use in ARDS is mostly for improvement of hypoxemia and oxygen saturation, but it has not been shown even in all comers ARDS to improve outcomes such as hospitalizations or mortality. So it's more for the management of oxygenation. Theoretically, we could say that it would work also in COVID and we have some experience showing that it does work in, with respect to improvement of oxygenation. And perhaps we have we have no information on PDE5 inhibitors, so the use of sildenafil, Viagra, et cetera, we do not know. Experience in our pulmonary hypertension patient tells me that it takes days, if not weeks or months, for those uh, drugs to have impact. So the inhaled route, if we're going to use it, is going to be the most effective if it has any effect. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all our speakers and remind our faculty you'll be receiving a notice of a faculty update uh, on various uh, things in the next uh, couple of hours, which will either take place um, Thursday night or early Monday morning, depending upon availability of, uh, of speakers. I look forward to your good health and stay safe. And if there's anything that I can do, don't hesitate to call me or email me. I wish you all the best. We'll leave the chat up. Thank you.